from SLB 22 on the big island of Hawaii. This is Immune, the podcast about the body's defenders against disease. This is episode number 61, recorded on October 28th, 2022. And I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today here at the Hilton Waikoloa Village from Ithaca, New York, Cindy Leifer. Hi, welcome. Aloha. From Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, great to be here where it is 79, sunny, and gorgeous. And formerly from Durham, North Carolina, We'll let, we'll let her tell you where she is now. Steph Lango, welcome. Hi, hi. Hey, Vincent, thanks for setting this up, and thanks for our guests for coming. And yes, I have left Duke University as of last week and starting an assistant professor position at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. So I'm going back to some cold weather after this. Steph has spent most of her career here on Immune. We had her as a grad student postdoc and now a new assistant professor. Cool. I know, which is wild. I don't go back and listen to myself in those early days. So for those who may listen for the first time, I apologize if I was green back then. And this was planned because she joined us as a PhD student. They said, hey, we're going to watch your career unfold. So this is really great. By the way, this is the first time we are all together live. Oh, yeah, that is. Right? Yeah. In person. In yeah. person. All at the same and time. We, we had yeah. to go to Hawaii to do this, but here we are. So this is <laughs> pretty amazing. exciting. Yeah. And before we introduce our guests, I just have to say I am really privileged to have these three co-hosts with me doing this every month. They're amazing. You know, they have labs. They have other things to do, but they choose to do science communication. So I would like to thank all of you for, for doing this with me. And so we have for you two guests today, talk about their careers uh, and their work from Vanderbilt University Medical Center, Julia Bohannon, welcome. Thank you, thank you for having me here today. And for Radboud University Medical Center, Musa Mlanga, welcome. Thank you, thank you. Glad to be here today. Uh, and before we talk about uh, your careers and your science, Cindy, just for our listeners, at home who don't have the, the privilege of coming to Hawaii. <laughs> what is SLB? <laughs> so SLB is the Society for Leukocyte Biology, and it's a really wonderful, welcoming community of scientists that I have the privilege of being one uh, a part of. And uh, it, we really do leukocyte biology research, but it's, bio, it's researched in all areas of immunology. And we have over a thousand members and they come from all over the world. So it's truly an international society. We have a society journal called the Journal of Leukocyte Biology that published fantastic science and, and actually has an impact factor of over six this year. So it's doing really, really well. And we all come together for our main event, which is the annual meeting. And the society is really reasonably priced and especially for trainees and it really is truly trainee focused. There's so many opportunities for trainees to get involved in leadership as well as present at the annual meeting and get support and win awards. So it's, it's really great for that. We have a lot of interesting initiatives and things that we're doing. And if you wanna check that out, you can go to leukocytebiology.org, which is the website. And um, also follow us on Twitter at leukocytebiol. So is the name of the society restrictive or can any immunology come here? Really, it, it's pretty much any immunology. You can see as you walk around the posters that are at this session, it's, it's really broad. Okay. All right. Thank you, Cindy. Yeah. So let's start with you, Julia. Let's uh, have you tell us how you got into science. Okay. Well, the trajectory of my career really goes back as far as I can remember. Um, so, I mean, I guess to make a very long story short, it, uh, I guess start, should start okay. at the we beginning. Like, we like long stories. Yeah, we're good with stories. All right, well, I was born in Louisville, Kentucky, 
but don't hold that against me because I'm a true blue Kentucky Wildcat fan for life. <laughs> but I grew up in Louisville. Um, I was born to two teenagers who were very much not anticipating me. <laughs> so my mother was 16, my father was 17, had no money. Uh, my mother was able to finish high school after I was born, but my father dropped out to um, work two jobs to support us. And shortly after I was born, they got married and moved us into a trailer home in Louisville. And a few months later, when I was nine months old, we had a propane tank hooked up to the trailer um, for to, to provide gas for the stove and for heating. And the gas company made a mistake and there was a leak and uh, gas was slowly leaking into the trailer while my mom and I were there the whole day. Um, my father got home from work, walked in, immediately smelled the gas, but Again, he's like 17 years old, doesn't think much of it. He sends my mom to the back of the trailer with me just in case as he tests out the stove. He went to light the stove and the entire trailer burst into flames and he was blown out and my mom and I were trapped inside. Um, a neighbor was able, able to come and um, put the flames out on him, uh, but they couldn't get inside to my mother and me. And she had to... Uh, just hold me in her arms and run through the flames in order to get out. And um, thankfully, her father, my grandfather, had been a volunteer firefighter and had taught her what to do in case she was ever in a fire and she knew to stop, drop, and roll and all of that and did that. And um, so then for the next couple of decades, I guess, we spent most of our time in the hospital having um, dozens and dozens of reconstructive operations, physical therapy. My mom ended up suffering from a traumatic brain injury that left her both physically and cognitively disabled for life, and she requires full-time care, um, and she was 17 at the time, so she, her entire life now requires full-time care. Um, and so I you know, spent all of this time surrounded by doctors and healthcare workers, and um, particularly my plastic surgeon. Um, I was very close to him. He was kind of like a grandfather to me. His, he had a granddaughter the same age as me and talked about her all the time, and he was very good at comforting me and during very, very scary times of going in for surgeries. He even pierced my ears for me during one of my surgeries so I would have something to look forward to and not be so scared. And uh, he delayed his own retirement in order to finish a second scalp expander that I had put in my scalp to give me hair on the left side of my head where it had all been burned off. Um, so I grew this, I had this great respect for these doctors that really took such good care of me. And in many cases, I think children would have been scared in the, you know, scared of their doctors in that situation. My doctors, I was not scared at all of them. I felt very safe in their hands. Um, the situations were scary, but I felt very safe with them. And I want, I, as long as I can remember, that's what I wanted to do. And so, you know, um, in school, you know, that was kind of the thought, I'm gonna go to medical school. And it just so happened I was very, very talented in science and that was my favorite classes and I just loved it and I had some excellent teachers that really instilled that into me. Um, and I went to college, Eastern Kentucky University, pre-med, um, very focused on that, like immediately was taking all of the pre-med classes, um, took 18 credit hours of like organic chem physics calculus that first semester, I'm like all in. Uh, but then it was my sophomore year, um, I wanted to get some research experience, um, so I reached out to my favorite professor, who was my genetics professor, to do some research in his laboratory, and uh, he was an incredible mentor, and I found that I loved being at the bench, and I loved bench work, I loved the science, um, in his lab, he did plant phylogeny. We were um, sequencing the goldenrod plant, which is the state flower of Kentucky. <laughs> and although I knew I wasn't that interested in plant biology and eventually I wanted to do something that was definitely um, human health oriented, um, I learned all of the basic lab techniques. I learned PCR, I learned some basic sequencing. And, and I had, again, a great mentor who knew what I wanted to do and encouraged me. And he um, also encouraged me to to take a gap year after college to gain some more research experience. Um, and he helped me write 
some um, applications to uh, apply for a research assistant position at the University of Kentucky, um, which I did, and I ended up working in the lab of Eric Blaylock and uh, Phil Lanfield in the Department of Pharmacology at University of Kentucky, and I stayed there for two years doing some Alzheimer's research and some sleep deprivation studies, learned some microarray analysis, um, but that was my first experience at a large medical center, and, um, and my mentor, Eric Blaylock, knowing that I you know, wanted to pursue graduate studies, treated me like a grad student right from the beginning and gave me those opportunities to present my work during lab meeting. He even let me go to a conf to neuroscience conference and present a poster, and I was just a tech. So I thought you know, he gave me some really great opportunities and gave me time to study for my GRE and was just incredibly supportive and gave me, you know, such a good experience of what it's like to be in one of these like big medical center labs, which, you know, I had no idea what to expect. Um, so I applied to graduate school after my time there um, and really only looked in Texas because uh, I was getting married and my husband was from Texas and really wanted to go back to Texas. And so I ended up at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, and that's where I did my PhD work. And at that time, I still wasn't sure what I was gonna do my research in. And I remember I knew I was interested in infectious diseases and, and I, kind of thought about back to where, you know, I had always wanted to be a burn surgeon, and I, but I didn't know what avenues there were to pursue, you know, research in that area. So I did a couple rotations, you know, in a herpes lab, a Francisella lab, just wasn't finding anything that fit. And I was walking to my car one day on campus, and I walked by Shriners Burn Hospital, which was right there on campus, and I just hadn't thought about it. I looked at it, and I'm like, I wonder if they do research in there. And sure enough, they do. And so for my final rotation, I just like looked at the website, looked at who's doing research, and I saw this one uh, professor, Dr. Tracy Tolliver Kensky, and she was doing immunology research, and I really didn't like immunology. So I was like, mm, we'll see. She, I, I, her, inter, her research was really interesting, I was like, I'm going to meet with her and see. And the moment I met with her, I knew she was somebody I wanted to work with. She was just incredible. And, um, and her work was really exciting. And so I joined her lab. And uh, we studied um, flat three ligand, which is a dendritic cell growth factor. And we had found, she had found previously that treating mice with flat three ligand um, after a burn injury would protect them against a subsequent wound infection. And so I took on a project in her lab studying how flat three ligand expanded dendritic cells were able to mediate protection. And I looked at the role of neutrophil and dendritic cell interactions, and it was a really great project. And um, I was able to publish, we published, I did four first author publications during my time in her lab, and um, we were really productive, even though we were hit by Hurricane Ike right in the middle and were out of the lab for several months. <laughs> that was the time to get some review papers out, <laughs> but we did it. Um, so then when it came time, um, I also had, I had a T32, um, a pre-doctoral T32, and um, had won several awards, and then it became time to look for a postdoc. And one of my uh, dissertation, uh, my committee members, um, had offered me a position in her lab, and I can't remember now what her research was on, but she wanted me to look at neutrophils and a viral infection, and, and it, I just... I was like, no, I want to keep doing this. I want to keep doing this. This is what, this is, I, I'm so passionate about this. This is all I want to do. And so I reached out to another one of my committee members, Dr. Ed Sherwood, and I, he wasn't looking for a postdoc at the time, but I said, hey, do you want a postdoc? Because I would really like to work with you. And he had done some previous studies looking at the toll-like receptor for agonist monophosphorolipidase, mediating protection against a burn infection. And he hadn't com um, gone on to pursue those studies any further. And at the time, he was just working on NK cells and sepsis. And I said, can I work on this project and continue these studies where you left off? And he said, well, are you sure you, want, you don't want to branch out and learn something new? And you know, if you stay studying the same model, you're not getting new training, and it's going to be hard for you to have an independent, successful career. And I said, you know what? That's not what's important to me. It's important to me to work on this. If that means I'm going to be a staff scientist in your lab and work with you 
you as long as you can fund me. I'm okay with that. I just know this is what I want to do. And he said, okay. <laughs> so, um, so I started working with him and um, I got a, an internal uh, postdoctoral fellowship pretty quickly. I wrote that like as soon as I finished my dissertation, I wrote that and got that. And a year into my postdoc with him, he drops a bombshell on me that he's moving to Vanderbilt. And um, then he says, you want to come with me and start, help me start up the lab? And uh, I, being from Kentucky and having gone through a hurricane already, I was so ready to leave Texas. <laughs> I told my husband, I'm like, it is time to leave. Let's, let's do this. It's close to home. So we went to Vanderbilt and I helped um, Edge start up the lab and um, decided to apply for an F32. Um, and I submitted it to NIAID and it got a 28 or 29, I think, which wasn't fundable. And the biggest critique was that this was, my project was not a new training the training potential was low because I was working with somebody I'd worked with during my PhD. I was in the same model system. Um, what new are you going to learn? And so I was a little discouraged and uh, resubmitted it and only got a 28. So they didn't really like my changes that much. Uh, but what I decided to do was just call up NIGMS and a program officer that I, I knew from there. And I said, hey, I submitted this F32 application to NIAID and it you know, got a decent score, but wasn't funded. And this is why. And he said, well, you know, maybe we'll discuss at our council meeting. And a couple of days before Christmas, he called me to say they were gonna fund me for a year. So sometimes making those calls <laughs> is really important. Um, so uh, I got that, and then um, for a year, I didn't. What I didn't tell them was that half of that year was spent um, on bed rest with a high risk pregnancy and maternity leave. <laughs> but during that time, um, because I had an incredibly supportive uh, mentor and a very supportive lab, I was able to complete my studies and do a lot of writing during that time, and um, got out my my uh, postdoctoral publication and another review paper um, during that time. And so when that was completed, um, my department decided to, or encouraged me to go up for um, a research assistant professor position so that I could then apply for my own funding. So I did that and with the intent of then applying for a K award or something like that, a mentored award. Um, and I started writing up a grant and started, you know, getting help from other people and having them look at it and they were like, you know, you should just apply for an R. And I'm like, you can't just apply for an R right out of a postdoc. And they're like, no, really, you should think about it. And so I talked to a couple different program officers at some meetings and one of them told me flat out, you know, you're, you're working with this, your postdoc mentor still, you're still in collaboration with him, you're doing similar work as him, you're doing similar work that you've been doing, you can't, do, you just might as well be a staff scientist, this is not gonna be successful. Then I had another one tell me, no, this is a great project. This is a really great project. I think you should apply for an R. And so we talked about it and decided um, I would go ahead and submit it and just see what they had to say. And um, very shockingly, it got an incredibly competitive score on the first submission and, and was funded. And uh, so I think it had to do, you know, when I look back on it all, it was very difficult in making that decision to put myself out there and go forward um, knowing that, that this, is, this is all I want to do. And you know, I have people telling me, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. And I think that instead what I did was I created a really good niche for myself and I was able to come, become an expert in this particular area and I'm very passionate about it. Um, so, and a lot of, I spent a lot of time not talking about my background and how my personal connection to my research because I wanted, I was afraid people would think that I was successful because of that. And I wanted to prove my, my merit, you know, scientifically. So I never talked about it. I mean, most people didn't even know. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, I got my first R01 and, you know, was, was becoming more comfortable with that and like, okay, I've done this, I've done this on my own, that it gave me the courage to then to be like, okay, well actually, this is really personal to me, and this is why. And I never intended to do anything else, and I'm literally living my dream right now, <laughs> doing what I've always wanted to do. Um, wow. That's, 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 that's amazing. That's a lot. We, yeah. we, we, we like that story. That was a long story. <laughs> we liked your long story. So the, the moral is, while mentors are important, sometimes you have to 
disagree with them. Yeah. yeah. Well, my mentors always had my back, I will say. It was others yeah. that, that, that took. My mentors were always there, always supported me and said, whatever you want to do, you can do. And they, you know, told me, I mean, it was, my, it was Ed Sherwood who told me, you need to submit this grant. And I said, I'm not going to get it. <laughs> He's like, just do it. Just <laughs> do it. Yeah. That belief in me, you know, helped me so much. And it was, you know, a big encouragement. And then, you know, I've Five years has gone by and that grant has ended. Actually, this year was the end of it and I got a R35 from an IGMS for the next five years. So, um, to continue my research program, which, you know, I still do work closely with Dr. Sherwood, but we're collaborators now and we're part of a team and we have our own independent projects, but we still help each other out. Um, and it's just a great environment and very supportive environment and we all work together and, um, I think it's what's helped us be very productive and very successful. So hopefully we can hear a little bit about your science. Yes, but, uh, I would love let's to talk give about Musa that. a chance to yeah. tell us. Yeah, tell us your story. Yeah, tell, tell us your story. story. <laughs> Did you also have a really interesting story? Um, I don't think my story is that interesting. And I, honestly, <laughs> um, I, I think we're going to think it's very interesting. I yeah, it I think it's. Uh, <laughs> I'm actually like was a little bit emotionally moved by your. Um, the story of uh, your uh, family in the, in the trailer and, and what happened and, and the multiple surgeries you had to go through. I think, um, yeah, just the, the, the circumstances of your early life uh, were very difficult. And, um, you know, you've, you've, you've traveled a long way. And uh, I think it's extremely impressive. I have uh, nothing Look at this podcast making me cry. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, we're I, and crying. I was emo so emotional. I could have just... For a minute, I kind of had to stop. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all I'm have really a story. Um, I think we all have a story. What is your story? Um, yeah, so, no, I mean, I think mine is a bit more prosaic uh, next, to, next to that story. And, and, um, and I, I, uh, I guess, yeah, I, I, I try to make it as interesting as possible, but I... <laughs> be good. Unfortunately, um, or rather fortunately, for me at least, um, I guess... I think I've been really lucky because my um, my parents and my grandparents uh, were all kind of were academics, and um, you know that's that's helps a great deal, and it's just such a contrast. I don't I don't know if I could have endured and and, and reached where I reached if if I'd been in your circumstances. So that's why I find it so impressive. Um, and um, I guess I'm abbreviating a lot of what I'm going to say by saying the following, which is that I, I, I have had the opportunity to work with many people who've had, um, you know, very, have had very difficult backgrounds, um, you know, similar to yours with very young parents or, you know, parents who didn't go to graduate school, etc. cetera. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult to have the, the um, persistence and the will to, to continue. And the mentorship, I think the mentorship is, is one of the most, um, you know, I, I want to say underrated aspects. Um, and it's not just mentorship in general. I think there's one component that many people, um, you know, don't absorb, which is it's always important to see people who kind of look like you doing something. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we all have that, you know, day during the year where it's like, bring your daughter to work. And we know that that's so influential to, for a young daughter to see their mother, you know, in a particular type of job. It's a, it's a sort of, you know, imprinting of men mentorship. And I think, um, you know, in your case, Obviously, you had a male mentor, but that was just so powerful and, and so influential for you. I think for me, just, you know, my circumstances allowed me to have that type of mentorship. But um, for many people, you know, it's, it's, it's just not there. So, yeah, I just, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm still, <laughs> I, it's, you know, I cannot be indifferent to what you said. So, um, I guess um, bringing back to, to my family, um, my grandfather uh, was from Zimbabwe, and he was educated at the only university in South Africa that allowed black people to go to university. And, but when he wanted to teach, it was not possible for him to, to, to teach at all. 
And, and so there were many people at that time who would travel to outside Zimbabwe to other parts of Africa or even to the United States. And that was the case for my dad. And so when my father was very young, um, my family uh, moved to the U.S. and he, he was able to like teach in Massachusetts. So my dad went to undergrad school in, in the U.S. He, he went to Clark and then he did his PhD at Columbia. And, uh, and my mother also went to graduate school. And, and I, I tell the story because I just think everything is very fortuitous. And, and, and my dad's PhD defense committee was some important person. I can't remember exactly who it was. I think Lady Bird Johnson or somebody, somebody like this. <laughs> and um, no, but uh, honestly, and, and uh, he finishes his defense in, in some kind of uh, environmental science or something. And, um, and she literally asks him, well, do you want to work for the United Nations? And, and my dad's like, oh, sure. <laughs> and so he, she writes him a little letter and he like, goes down to like 42nd and 1st Avenue, gives this letter to the person the next week and he's like, sure, you can have a job. Yeah, no problem, here's a job. Um, and a few weeks from now, you can go, go work in Geneva with these other people in Switzerland. So um, that's like, just, you know, I think, that, that was very influential for my dad. This is many years before I was born, but that also like, changed the circumstances a lot of his life. Um, and you know, those, those, those are all fortuitous events that, that really are fairly influential to like, whatever happens afterwards in your life when you have kids or your family, whatever. So, um, but I guess for me, I think I, I I got to grow up in, in different parts of the world, and um, I'll just you know keep it really short and simple. Um, I, I then was thinking of going to medical school when I finished undergrad, and um, I think that was like really a seminal moment for me because I um, I took a year off and I went to work for the NRDC, uh, the Natural Resources Defense Council. And I had this fellowship from them. And when I was there, I, um, I worked on public health because I thought I was gonna go to medical school, but I was really interested in science, but I thought, well, yeah, well, I'll do this public health thing. It'll help me get into medical school. And um, I worked on a project that was evaluating all the public health benefits of the International United Nations Conference on the Environment and evaluating how, for example, you know, eliminating, eliminating lead or having fresh water has influenced public health. And I was writing a book about this. So this is like right out of uh, college. And uh, I was working in New York City and at the NRDC. And um, I did this for about a year. And you know, we wrote a couple of books about it. And I got to meet lots of really interesting people. and. Um, you know, but I, I, I kind of was already way more interested in science at that point and way more interested in research. And so my, you know, during that year, I was like, yeah, I was supposed to apply to medical school. And I was like, I don't know if I want to go to medical school, but whatever. And, um, and then I deferred because the second year I was going to go and live in Asia for a year. So I did. I lived in Japan for almost a year, and this was two years after undergrad. And uh, during that time, I kind of was more convinced that I didn't want to go to medical school. And, but I applied anyway, and um, my, um, when decision time came, um, I had this pressure from my two parents. So my dad, well, let me start with my mom. My mom was like, um, I actually have to read this because I, <laughs> I had to write this for uh, something else. And um, so my mom said something to me, which I'll never forget. And she said, you know, um, if you are a scientist, it's going to be so hard for you, very difficult for you, because you're black. And if you're a doctor, no one can take away your ability to heal people. And it doesn't matter how racist people are they still have to deal with the fact that you can actually heal them. And so, so she was like, you know, 
I don't know, for the circumstances of your life, I just feel like as a mother, this would be easier for, for you, you know? And um, my dad was like, you know what? If I was your age, I just am so fascinated by biotechnology. It's like gonna change the world and life sciences is amazing. Forget about medicine, go do a PhD. Oh my God, your life is gonna be so interesting. You don't have to deal with any of these things. You know, your life has been so great. Life is, you know, my dad has like this, you know, I've told you his life, right? So he's like, don't worry about it. Everything will be fine. <laughs> and, um, you know, just kind of pull the future forward. It'll all be okay. So I guess you know what path I took. Was there a tiebreaker? No, there was like, like it was sort of like, uh, we were sitting there in Long Island at my uncle's house and he was like more with my mom, I guess, but he wasn't really a tiebreaker because I, was, I, I wasn't interested. I was, already, I was already on to something else. And, um, and I was really lucky because when I worked at the NRDC, um, there were lots of amazing people. And one of them had worked at Nature and she knew the editor of Nature Biotechnology. And so, I reached out to her and I said, um, hey, and her name is Claire, and I said, Claire, um, do you think I could like, talk to your friend in Nature Biotechnology? And she said, yeah, of course, I'm sure he'd love to talk to you. So I meet with the deputy editor of Nature Biotechnology and he says to me, um, yes, you made the right decision. Um, I'm gonna give you an internship here, but I'm also, gonna make sure that you go work in a lab at the Rockefeller. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I was like, I, you know, I never worked in a lab at undergrad. I was like, you know, no idea what working in a lab means. And he's like, well, this is what you're gonna do. You're gonna work for me in the morning and you're gonna read all these papers. And in the afternoon, you're gonna go work in the lab and you're gonna do this for the next six months. And then you're gonna apply to the school. So uh, I just got completely crushed. And um, uh, I did that. And then, um, yeah, I ended up starting my PhD in the same lab. And um, yeah, and then uh, I, um, my first project was a project on molecular beacons. Um, and um, I guess I was really fortunate to be kind of like in the right place at the right time. So um, I was working on how to design something called spectral genotyping. And um, in the end, um, yeah, that would be like the first paper that I would publish. And um, it would be, it was in science. It was, it was amazing. And um, we figured out a way to be able to spectrally genotype um, people who had the Delta 32 CCR5 mutation by using real-time PCR machines. And there was only two real-time PCR machines in the whole world at the time. It was one in our lab. <laughs> 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 at the Rockefeller, there's one in, in, in California at, at Perkin Elmer. So, um, so we were like way, way ahead of the game for that. And, um, and then that whole tech was used to be able to detect drug resistant TB from our lab. And then that became like the standard test that was used everywhere in the world. And, um, and then I, um, Actually, my uh, PhD mentor originally was uh, more David Ho, who was an HIV biologist, but the people working on molecular beacons were uh, Sanjay Tiagi and Fred Kramer, who were in the same building, and they were from NYU. So um, I was working all the time with them, so I just became their student, and it was, you know, it was, all, it was all fine. And, um, and they worked a great deal on RNA, and um, so I was extremely interested in RNA um, and I guess Fred, my, my PhD mentor, had, was one of the first people to sequence RNA and, and his PhD mentor was also one of the first people to actually discover a type of MIDI variant RNA and you know, all from Rockefeller. So um, what happened was I started to think about how to use molecular beacons to be able to visualize RNA. And this was part of a general thing that was happening in New York at the time um, with somebody who 
I really have a great deal of respect for um, at, at Einstein, who, who developed um, techniques around visualizing RNA with MS2 uh, GFP. And so um, his name is Rob Singer. And Rob Singer basically and, and Sanjay were kind of like leading this field, like pioneering this field of imaging of RNA. So um, we, um, we, we worked a lot on developing all the techniques around that, extremely complex at the time, um, from building microscopes to be able to do this, um, and finding the ideal developmental systems to do this. We used Drosophila to do this developmental Drosophila embryos to do this, actually oocytes. And um, you know, just things were not very off the shelf at that, at that juncture of the life, molecular life sciences. Um, so, you know, you had, to, you had to learn how to do and build a lot of things yourself, and which, is, which is what we did. And, you know, we, we, we managed to, um, yeah, to really um, um, do a lot of very interesting uh, research on RNA localization and understanding RNA trafficking in different contexts. And, um, and also understanding nuclear RNA biology and, and how RNA goes from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. So, um, you know, that was, that was me, that's sort of my, my PhD work was in this. And, and when I finished, um, I, I really wanted to um, continue working on um, transcription and RNA and imaging. And the best imaging places in the world at the time were um, at the EMBL uh, in Heidelberg and at the Pasteur in France. And since I'd grown up in Europe, in, in, in Switzerland and in France, I, I, sp I spoke French fluently. So um, I was more attracted to working in, in, at the Pasteur in, in, in France. So I, um, so I got an NSF postdoctoral fellowship uh, to work at the Pasteur. And um, there I, I worked way more in what I, closer to what I work in now, which is I started to work on nuclear organization and imaging of transcription, not in a Drosophila model, but more in, in different other cellular models, and especially using approaches like a single molecule fish, uh, which we had developed in my PhD lab, and I guess is used everywhere now to, to be able to image RNA. Um, and so, I think, you know, that, that period of time, like in those early 2000s, mid-2000s, uh, 2005 to 2010, super exciting time for imaging and super exciting time for trying to image RNA and understanding transcription, um, understanding nuclear architecture. And intellectually, I mean, that was, you know, really like a very strong focus of, of, of the field. And I know maybe for people in the leukocyte society that's kind of doesn't really resonate, but I think, um, you know, we had, there were so many, uh, this, so many uh, things happening in terms of imaging and microscopy with many physicists like Eric Betzig entering this area and, and you know, developing different types of microscopes that could be used for, for example, super resolution microscopy. And, um, and so when I had the opportunity to uh, start my own lab, um, I, um, I don't know, I just, I really wanted to make a difference. And, um, you know, I had a few choices. I could like stay in Europe, go back to the US, or do something a little left field. And to be honest, the left field thing was not, like, I was open to it because I was already working in France and living in, in Paris and at the Pasteur, and that was a really very different thing to do at the time. Um, but it kind of came out of the blue. And the reason it came out of the blue was because of my last name. And I got this email one day from some people in South Africa who worked for this, the South African National Lab and they were like, oh, because you are South African, I'm not South African, <laughs> and you are working in these areas that are interesting, like in, to synthetic biology, 
we are interested in setting up a program in synthetic biology in South Africa. And I thought, okay, I don't know what this is about. And I just ignored this email. And then I got the same email again. And I think that it was on the third time I wrote back and I said, okay, fine, like, let me, let me uh, know a little bit more. And so they told me, yeah, we are really interested in getting people to work in this area. And um, we've already attracted people to come and work in nanobiology and, and nanotechnology uh, at our national lab. And now we want to do things in synthetic biology. And so I was, I was like, well, let me go and see like what this is like. And I'd been to South Africa on, on vacation a couple of times. And so I went and I looked at their national lab and I was like very, I was actually quite impressed. But what impressed me even more was the amount of money they wanted to spend at the time. <laughs> and I was like, wow, that's a lot of money you guys want to spend. Do you know exactly what you want to do with that? And um, um, I'm being facetious. But to cut a long story short, the opportunity like arose and I thought, you know, this is like such a, interesting opportunity and if I don't take this opportunity now you know when I'm older and it's harder and you know there's all kinds of other things going on in your life you're not really going to try to do this and um and where so, in South Africa is that national lab by the way it's in Pretoria okay yeah it's in Pretoria good question so um so I ended up saying yes to this position but my mom said to me you know you got to be really careful because <laughs> if you go to Africa you know just really, and I'm not saying this to be pejorative, like you're just not sure what can happen. So you better have another lab <laughs> or some other job in another place just to be sure that you're gonna be okay. So this time I listened to my mom. <laughs> and so, so I, I had a lab in Portugal, which was like about like an adjunct position. And I had um, like a 20% affiliation there. Oh. And, um, and my first graduate student, um, came from Portugal, a super talented uh, optical physicist whose name is Ricardo Enriquez. And um, so Ricardo and I, and uh, one other like uh, sort of a optical scientist from the Pasteur who was kind of loaned to me by the head of the imaging facility who was you know, a great, great friend, decamped to South Africa and we built like one of the first super resolution microscopes. And, um, and Ricardo, um, you know, like with sheer will, developed um, this program called Quick Palm to be used for super resolution, which became the de facto kind of model for using and implementing super resolution microscopy. And, like everywhere in the world. And we, we, we were absolutely inundated when the, the paper came out in Nature Methods. So we were there for like a year and everybody thought like we moved to South Africa just for the World Cup. <laughs> and we were just like making this stuff up, you know, and uh, we were just gonna go there for a couple of years and then come back to Europe or go back to the US. But uh, like in 2010, like, you know, we'd been there a year and then this great paper came out and, you know, people from Nikon came to our lab and taking all these pictures of a microscope and yeah, so it was, it was really great. And, and Ricardo is just like outstanding scientist, um, you know, developed quick palm, uh, went on to do a, a postdoc for a year and, and, you know, he, he started his own lab at University College of London and, and he's a full professor now, but, um, that was sort of the platform of technology that we needed to go on to do all the other science that we were interested in understanding gene regulation and, and nuclear architecture. And so I'll stop there because I think like everything there sort of harmonizes our stories a little bit. But um, you know, I think in, in, that, in, in sort of that journey in South Africa, I don't think I could have done that same journey in, 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 in that amount of time with those accessibility, those resources and the freedom I would have had to deal with so many other things. Um, and lots of questions like, why are you doing this? In South Africa, they were like, dude, just you go ahead, man. We don't know what you're doing, just, just you do it. You know, go build that optical table, do whatever you want. And um, that, was, that was great. But um, that, I don't think that would have been the same 
in, um, in, in, in a different environment, at least with the same degrees of freedom. So, so yeah, so I mean, great adventure. So, so what I'm getting from both of your stories is um, that you should look at what you want to do, not what is the thing you're supposed to do, but go after what you want um, and you can sort of build a cool trail because I think that you've both done that. Um, I've also noticed in looking at uh, the work that you're both doing that you've built that cool trail um, into trained immunity. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could uh, tell us a little bit about trained immunity, I guess, from your point of view. We have two different, yeah. pl very different. places very different. coming into trained yeah. immunity. So, so what yeah. is it? And yeah. What do you, what do you yeah. think it is? So, um, so like I said, when I started my postdoc, I was working on this toll-like receptor 4 agonist, monophosphorolipidase. And what we knew at the time was that if you inject mice with this, they are then subsequently protected from a gram-negative infection. So what MPLA is, it's, um, it's very similar to LPS, uh, but it's gone through a hydro... Uh, um, hydrolysis that has removed the phosphate group, one of the phosphate groups, and that makes it significantly less toxic to humans. Um, so there were studies done back in the 50s where they had treated mice with LPS and found that that protected them against subsequent infection. But, the, you know, I mean, what you can't treat people with LPS and protect them against infection. But this MPLA offered a way that we could potentially do this in a less toxic way and still get the immunomodulatory effects. And MPLA is actually already used as a vaccine adjuvant and is safe to use in people. Um, so, but we wanted to know how is it doing this and does it protect against, you know, only uh, TLR4 um, um, activating pathogens or anything else? And so that was my postdoctoral project was to try to figure out what the molecular, me cellular mechanisms that were involved were. And um, I tested against a Pseudomonas aeruginosa burn wound infection, a systemic staph infection, and a systemic candida albicans infection. And we found it protected against all of them. So it was broadly protective, nonspecific. Um, and then what we also found was that this protection lasted for quite a while. And so we thought that was interesting because we knew this was mostly mediated by innate leukocytes, um, which typically are not thought of as having a memory. And um, we saw that it lasted for up to about two weeks. And so we had a really talented MD-PhD student a few years back who started reading on those papers that were coming out from Mihai Nedia's group and Luke O'Neill about these, uh, this um, metabolic reprogramming that was going on in um, leukocytes that's mediating this memory effect. Um, and this was done mostly with BCG and beta-glucan. And uh, my post or my, uh, yeah, my postdoc mentor, Dr. Sherwood, had worked on beta-glucan for a number of years. He worked on it during his graduate studies and, and had seen that it was also protective. And so um, then this idea of trained immunity kind of was just coming out. Um, a few years back. And so we were like, I think that's what we're seeing in our models. And so this grad student um, decided we should look at the metabolism of the cells and see if we're getting this similar metabolic reprogramming that they're seeing in their trained immunity and their trained um, leukocytes. And we found, indeed we did. So um, what we see is, and what studies have shown with trained immunity is that priming with a pathogen recognition, um, a PAMP, um, can induce a inflammatory response, a transient inflammatory <laughs> response that leads to this metabolic reprogramming that's evidenced by um, increased glycolysis and ox oxidative phosphorylation. And what we found is that that coincides with an increase or an enhancement of antimicrobial functions that allows these innate leukocytes to be better at killing bacteria and clearing infection. And any kind of bacteria, gram-negative, gram-positive, or fungal, you know, a, it's broadly protective. And um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> what, what, I was, what I was thinking is like, you have these, the observational outputs in, in animals and in cells, but the question is how do the cells remember? Right. Mm -hmm. So, because so, we know that for adaptive immunity, it's very clear yes. because it's programmed into the individual yes. clonal cells. Yes. But it was much less clear for a long time exactly right. how an innate immune cell would remember. remember. And, and that goes to that Musa. Goes to yeah. Musa. So, so that the how genetic do innate immune cells remember. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I guess 
I'm not, I just want to say ahead of time, I'm not an immunologist. You can hear that <laughs> you from everything that, I've said now. <laughs> immunologists say as soon as you start working on an immune cell or an immune system or a vaccine, you, you de facto become yeah, an immunologist. You're an immunologist. We, we, so you, we, you, we you're not everyone. allowed to use that anymore. You yeah. come to an immunology meeting, you get to call yourself We'll put a sticker on you. I am an immunologist. <laughs> Thanks, Stephanie. You're welcome. Um, the only reason is I just, uh, I don't understand all the cell types and blah, okay. blah, the receptors. Anyway. Um, I think, you know, just to tell you philosophically what our framework is and how we came to this is that we are really, uh, our work is about trying to understand how transcription and genes are regulated. And, um, and, and we are most interested in two parts, the role of chromatin architecture, so, you know, the folding of the genome, and, you know, this, this we worked on using all the imaging tools that I described earlier. And, um, and, and sort of try to understand how long-range contact is, is causal to transcription. But the organization on regulation of transcription within these compartments is something that we really believe uh, is highly assisted by the non-coding genome. And uh, that's something that we have focused a lot on, this combination of the 3D architecture and the non-coding RNA and the, and the interplay of these two to regulate transcription. So during my PhD, one of the things that one of my mentors worked on a great deal was stochastic gene expression. And how do you go from robust to stochastic or stochastic to robust, like these, these, this interplay. And you have to integrate this into the architecture in which this is occurring. So it would appear that to have more robust transcription, non-stochastic transcription, because most gene expression is stochastic, you need to organize the nuclear architecture in a particular way. Like, so these long-range loops in you would need to be organized in a particular way. And you would need to use non-coding RNAs to facilitate that robust uh, transcription event. And we really looked for different models to be able to test some theories that we had, hypotheses that we had on this. And the immune system was the model, okay? That's basically what it is. And so there was a really great review from Karen Alderman about, oh, well, you know, there's this sort of importance of the transcription cycle in immunology and certain histone modifications and how they are really important in driving the transcription cycle in immune cells in immediate early gene expression. And that's really how we came to it, like trying to understand this. And we picked a specific set of genes. We happened to pick the chemokine genes at first to study this. And I think um, we didn't see this as, as in trained immunity or native immune memory at that time. Um, it was only when um, Mihai came to South Africa and he gave a talk at the University of Cape Town where I was. And I was like, you know, this is exactly what we see when you have robust gene expression in the models that we're looking at. But he did not understand how the actual memory was being written. And I think, as, as you said, Cynthia, I think which is really important, the, the actual physical agent of memory in the adaptive immune system is either the TCR or the antibody. That is the physical yep. memory. Yep. And, and, and there's a permanence to that memory, and it can be colonially expanded, but it, yep. you know, to remove it is very difficult. Innate immune memory is a histomark. It's a chemical modification that is really a byproduct of metabolism, and it's very important to remember the next thing I say, is that it can be written and erased continuously. And so you can't erase a TCR, you can't erase an antibody, but epigenetic memory can be written and erased continuously and is subject to a lot of environmental influences. So that aspect for me was, is particularly interesting because it shows like the plasticity that sits above our sort of ACTG model we have of the genome. And this epigenome that is built into the amount of transcription that we can do, plus the architecture of the chromatin that contributes to the capacity to have robust transcription are all environmental effects that are independent of whether you have a particular sequence or not. 
And so for me, um, you know, this aspect of the memory, this epigenetic aspect of the memory, and it's almost transient state, it's non-permanence, is, is, is very, very, very important. And so uh, a lot of our work is in, in, I think, the true epigenetic organ, which is the bone marrow, because it really, you know, this is where these influences are the most powerful. So, that, so that's how we come at it. And uh, so, you know, we dis were very fortunate uh, to discover this family of, of non-coding RNAs that seem to be very important in regulating the, the innate immune memory process in, in myeloid cells. And, um, and of course, this, a similar type of mechanism is, exists in, in other cell types. Uh, but, but, you know, this particular family is very, very, very um, important. And, and, you know, yeah. So I have a question. One of the things that we often do in immunology is once we learn how something works, we try to figure out how to manipulate it to treat or, or exploit, right? So are there... Are there ways that you think that we could use this to treat or exploit for therapeutic purposes? Well, for us, I mean, we, um, we definitely are, are doing a lot of work in this area. Um, just, you know, superficially, we, we've used a, uh, antisense oligonucleotides to target these long, long coding RNAs which act like rheostats to the immune system. Mm -hmm. And we've used them to, to target you know, major uh, cytokines and chemokines in, for example, sepsis. And um, we've done that in different models, like in humanized mass models and other types of models uh, to treat you know, a few diseases in, in preclinical models. And uh, in fact, we've even you know, uh, like co-founded uh, biotech startup in this area just to be able to drug the, the non-coding genome um, around these, you know, inf in inflammation responses. So um, I think it definitely is possible. It is 98% of the genome. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, 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 it does allow us to have a kind of rheostat control over the um, responses that we see in the immune system. And how about you? Did you have any thoughts on that as yeah, well? Yeah, um, no, um, the idea that we have in our models is um, to potentially restore immunosuppression that we see in patients that are immunosuppressed. And if we can ramp up that these antimicrobial responses in these cells and metabolism in these cells and get them to do the job that they're supposed to do when they've become defective due to this trauma, this injury, and if we can restore that and get them to do what they're supposed to do and then can subsequently protect a patient who is at very high risk um, from a subsequent infection that could be lethal. Um, so the idea would be to um, treat these patients um, prior to an infection because as we know, treatments for sepsis have not been very effective. So if we can prevent that sepsis from occurring in those patients that are at the highest risk, get it before that happens, um, then we can bypass that completely and potentially restore that protection. So, I mean, using the body's own defenses the way that they should be working. I have questions mostly for you, but can be for both. Age differences in trained immunity. And speaking to your story, you were a baby. Yeah. What are the differences in trained immunity in young versus old versus middle age? Yeah. And how, what can we learn from that? Yeah. Um, I can't answer specifically to the the different in ages in, in our models, in our hands. Um, we have done some studies in aged mice um, who are, the aged are more immunosuppressed and at risk for infection, and we have found that our therapies are just as effective in the aged mice. Um, but as far as differences between young, young and old, you know, I, that remains to be seen. Yeah. But I and I ask because the, with coronaviruses being the common cold, and of course SARS-CoV-2, that there, there is a hypothesis that children are, their trained immunity may be higher because they're constantly getting bombarded yeah. at daycares and schools yeah, with these respiratory yeah. infections. And does that play a role? So that was what I led see. to that yeah, question. Yeah, no, it yeah. certainly could. Yeah, and yeah, kids are definitely exposed. And we get this natural kind of trained immunity all the time when right. we're exposed right. to things on a daily basis. 
Sure. So, and that's that's how our body, I mean, it's natural for our immune system to have these exposures, and that's why we don't get sick all the time, people with immune, that are immune competent. Um, that's why we don't get sick, but then there are these people that are at very high risk that don't have properly functioning immune cells. And if we can restore that or enhance those functions, we could potentially protect these patients. So. Cool, thanks. I think, I think what you're saying about aging is uh, very important in terms of you know, the, the plasticity of the immune system and, and the ability to, to form adaptive or uh, innate memories. But I also just want to point out something which is to reinforce the, the points that um, were made earlier, which is that um, we do, like uh, at the moment, uh, Mihai, Natea, and, and myself do have a, a couple of you know, human cohort studies going where we are looking at, at, at training immunity in older individuals. We're using vaccination as, as a vector to understand that. And um, I think one of the things we do think is important to point out is there, are, there is what we would call like pathogenic training and, and beneficial training. And these two things are quite important. And, and maybe I, I, I'm kind of careful how I use the training <laughs> language. So, you know, there, there are things like uh, OxLDL and, and there are things like uh, uric acid that are, let's call it um, pathogenic ways that the chronic inflammation gets established, which seem to occur through trained immunity pathways. And then there are like what we call beneficial trained immunity that seems to come from vaccination or maybe things, exposures to things like beta-glucan or other beta-glucan-like substances that are, are actually protective and, and beneficial to the innate immune memory. Now, there are things you could do in aged people uh, to boost innate immune memory. Um, and, you know, we've seen, for example, BCG vaccination could be one of them, revaccination. Um, so I think, I think the, the, there's still um, some work that, that I think is, you'll see over the course of the next few years that'll kind of illuminate the subject a, a little bit more. Um, so I found that um, detail about um, pathogenic versus protective trained immunity quite interesting in your talk. So just let me know if I'm understanding no, no, no. this correctly. Yes. Um, so the pathogenic trained immunity may be something that is happening in response to some self antigens or some self molecules like OxLDL. Um, it's not that they are from a pathogen oh, uric, uric acid, or from yes. uric acid. Um, it's that they are actually causing issues, whereas the other ones were from pathogens, <laughs> but they were in fact protective. <laughs> oh, I see what you're saying, like uh, beta glucan. Yeah. You could say that. Yeah, I was expecting something that. completely different. But you could say that. that that's, yeah, okay. that's, I mean, it's an interesting okay, perspective, so. yes. Yeah, interesting. You could say so, that. So, um, I hate to cut this short, but we've... I know, uh, I could sit here all day and talk yeah, about it. <laughs> People want to go to the luau or something. <laughs> so uh, I would love to have each of you back again individually because yeah, we could go be really awesome. deep into some of your science, which is what we usually do uh, on immune. So uh, we'll be in touch. We'll do part two. With yeah. Both of you. Yeah. So that's uh, immune. In Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> number 61, questions and comments could be sent to immune at microbe.tv. And as Cindy mentioned, uh, we are a nonprofit, the parent company. Microbe TV is a nonprofit and we exist by the support of our listeners. So we can go over to microbe.tv slash contribute and make a donation. It's US tax deductible. Julia Bohannon is at Vanderbilt University. Julia underscore Bohannon on Twitter. Many thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Victor. It's great Vincent, to be here. Vincent. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> I admit, but, uh, uh, there was a guy years ago. That's used to my call maiden me, name, too. He <laughs> called me Victor on study section for three years. <laughs> so I remember that really well. It's okay. No worries. Musa Mlanga is at Radboud University Medical Center. Is that where you are? Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Okay, because we didn't get into that part, but you moved. From... Not, a, not a problem. Thanks for joining us. Um, you're welcome. Thanks for inviting me. And I never saw you in New York. I'm surprised. We, we've, I've been there for many, many 40 oh, years. And, uh, great, yeah. But There's a lot of people live in New York. Yeah, I <laughs> just a few. Just a few. Anyway, no, on no, Twitter. Not too many. M-H-L-A-N-G-A-L-A-B. Cindy Leifer is at Cornell University. Cindy Leifer on Twitter. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you. This was fun. Thanks for uh, actually 
arranging this and yeah. getting our guests. Really a uh, pleasure. And uh, Steph Langles at Case Western Reserve University. Thanks, Steph. Yes, thanks. Thanks to our guests. Thanks to the audience for coming. We appreciate you. Stephanie Langle on Twitter and Brianne Barker's at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here and great to have these awesome guests. Thank you. I want to thank SLB22 for having us at their meeting and particularly Jennifer Holland for working out all the details, we really appreciate it. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Music on Immune is by Steve Neal. Thanks for listening to Immune, the podcast that's infectious. We'll be back next month. Woo-hoo. Thank you. Woo-hoo.